thanks very much to LRNG for inviting me to be a part of this. I'm, I'm really excited to come and share what is really an incredible success story under some pretty trying circumstances. Um, and it's, of course, it's led to other good things, and it's also led to some a whole host of other problems, uh, which are good problems to have relative to where we were. So first, let me tell you a little bit about Liquid. Um, we discovered through the sales process that not too many people knew the details of who we are, but we've got a very large presence in Africa. In South Africa, we only have about a four to 7%, depending on products and, and, and lines, market share in the fiber business. But if you look at where we are, we've got over 110,000 kilometers of fiber stretching from Cape to Cairo. And uh, our boss, Strive Masiwa, made a big deal about um, getting what Cecil John Rhodes couldn't get right, uh, at least with fiber, a couple of hundred years later. We're also now stretching across to the West Coast and starting to really offer a pan-African solution. And we're expanding beyond just a traditional connectivity model into one of business systems integrators uh, and enterprise solutions. And hopefully you will have seen some of the advertising around me being Africa's cloud. So we've got this incredible story that started 19 years ago that is the basis of how LRNG and Liquid resonated with each other and why I think we've got some incredible results so far. 20 years ago, Strive started the business in Zimbabwe and ended up in a situation where they had a constitutional battle, which they won to guarantee connectivity as a right to every Zimbabwean. And uh, this has just blossomed into a business model, which is let's treat it as if though it is a right for every African to be connected. And so the principle of every African being connected is something that you'll hear me talk about just now in the relationship uh, with LRNG and where their stretch and reaches and where their geography also takes them and how we've linked up. But bringing it back to the issue at hand, which was the sales team, we had a significant challenge as did many businesses uh, during the middle of COVID. And we were also busy transforming. From a strategic perspective, we were moving away from pure connectivity and we had two rounds, 2017 and late 2019, uh, of Section 189 restructuring. And they were strategic restructuring where we moved a bunch of old-fashioned technology away from the business and started moving towards the cloud and the kind of skills and talent that needed to go with that. And with that came new people, new game plans, new customers, new ways of thinking. And it was, it was difficult to transform. We also had, at the time that uh, we actually launched the course, our third CEO in four years. And for those of you who've been through stuff like that will know that that's, it's got its own challenges. Um, and uh, I'll tell you how Dion Kaiser, who joined us at that time, really capitalized on this as, as entrenching what it is our business is today and how we tackled what is really a very largely dysfunctional organization. Uh, in the South African context, Liquid had purchased the old Neotel, um, which was the second network operator. And there were some issues around uh, that sale and what it was doing. And there was much to be sorted out. And it all started with getting the right customers on the sharp edge of the sword and getting the sales right. And of course, we were then hit with COVID. And everything, almost everything, became online. Obviously, in a digital business, we were happy to start selling work from anywhere, work from home, et cetera. And we became very much that. But with working online comes significant challenges, especially in dealing with um, getting people to learn and communicate and collaborate and share. And Teams is good. Uh, it does a great job of it. But you miss a lot of the interpersonal space. So with this context, we had to start thinking about making a plan. And I had a colleague from uh, one of my consulting days who had previously worked with LRNG and Honey and I reconnected and we started talking about what we could do. And one of the most amazing things was early, early on, and it was indicative to me of how LRNG works, is that Ricky Robinson reached out to me and we connected. And he was involved in the client relationship as tenuous and as small as it may have been at that point, 
Um, I got involved with understanding who the company was, what it was about, and what their purpose was. And learning about the biobabs of, of, of LRMG and what it is that our purpose from the Zimbabwean story of leaving the African behind resonated straight away. And I got to meet Nozipo, and then eventually I got to meet Mike. And if there's anybody who is the quintessential partner or key account manager in sales terms, that's Mike. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm reluctant for him to work with other people. I kind of want him to myself. But this is the beginning of a powerful, powerful partnership that's been through some incredible challenges. Not everything goes the way that you plan them, but the way that we have been partnered in delivering what we know we want to deliver for Africa, not just for liquid, not just for the salespeople in liquid, and not just for the task at hand, but bearing in mind what it is we're actually trying to do for the continent. Um, and having heard the Miriam Makeda story earlier, there is incredible resonance with, with what it is that we were trying to do. So we got stuck into some incredible design and we started looking for a solution that was going to transcend the online environment, the very low morale, the difficult leadership and functional and process problems that we had, and still somehow go and fetch and find new customers in a new way with a new demand with new products, all almost too much. But in talking to Mike and getting something out, we started speaking about gamification and doing it literally with some games in mind. And it started off with some sports. And what we had with Nick uh, Radnick, who was the group CEO at the time, was uh, going down the road of some soccer. We thought that was more universal, it would be understood across Africa, um, and it would be something that from a group perspective, we could roll out the program beyond that. And we started, because Nick is a fan of uh, Jose Mourinho, and we were originally down that road. But the new CEO, Dion, arrived, and he said, we need to do the rugby. It's a South African opportunity. We need to run on the world back of the great 2019 Rugby World Cup win. And there is a lot of positivity along with the movie that is called Chasing the Sun that was out at the time. So we did. We shifted it. And Dion, as a new CEO, got behind this in a powerful way. And I've got to tell you, that's one of the keys to success. If the CEO is not behind a program like this, well, if he's not behind it in the way that Dion was behind it, you're not going to get the kind of incredible results I'm going to show you just now. And I'm talking measurable financial business results, not just the um, motivational team skills, capabilities, talent oriented results. I'm talking hardcore numbers and significant hardcore numbers. So we resonated, unfortunately, <laughs> with the story of being the underdogs. Um, and that was, you know, again, in South Africa, from a connectivity perspective, you've heard me say it's between 4 and 7%, depending on the product, of market share in that space. So we had to get salespeople who were typically considered order takers, uh, had long-standing relationships, pretty much in the government sector, um, and were wholesale in, our, in nature. A couple of channel partners in the ISP space, and it was very pedestrian and very ordinary in the way that we were approaching the way that we do business and what we were trying to sell. So this had to be shifted up a gear fast. Um, and Dion, uh, as the CEO, saw the opportunity, saw the sharp edge of the sword and worked well with us to give us the support, lend his ear. And of course, that worked phenomenally in getting otherwise demotivated people. And it wasn't just sales, but to come and attend group online sessions and be there for the full two hours where some of you will know that the online world is, is that the, the link is alive, but uh, someone's getting coffee, someone's doing something else. But with the new CEO behind it, with a new drive and a lot of motivation, something changed. So we were very keen to take the messages and the key messages of Chasing the Sun and what Rassi Erasmus did to, to really drive the message properly. And Obviously, there were some skills to be delivered, and we had a problem to solve of getting people with different baggage, different teams, remarkably different attitudes, and you could quite fairly say depressed, demoralized, downtrodden, uh, uninvolved, uh, 
very, very typical for the COVID period. But um, in particular, with all the Section 189s, this was becoming difficult. Along with learning new technologies, along with learning uh, new partners, and we partnered very strongly with Microsoft now, um, and learning new products and learning new pricing things, all of those things lent to complaints, problems, issues. So the question was, how do we do that? So we sat down and we devised the tournament. And the tournament was the Sales Accelerator Bootcamp. And there were some key themes and messages that were driven along that. And it was driven by Rassi Erasmus's, you must bring your own tassi, your own suitcase. For those of you who are not from South Africa, tassi is a small suitcase. And <clears throat> there's different items in there. And each one of us has different baggage with different skills, with different talents. And you must bring that suitcase and that whole suitcase to every game. And this is stuff that came out in Chasing in the Sun. And there was a wonderful um, case study that both Ricky and Nozzy presented that, again, had everyone attending for the full duration. And it sent the message of what it is that we were going to do differently. And those of you not familiar with rugby or South African rugby in particular, is there was a culture of the way that that team used to run, uh, not the least of which was the selection of team members. It used to be done individually in private and you were told whether or not you didn't make it and some quiet reasons here and there. But Rassi changed that. And he said, you now need to show up. You need to show up. You need to bring your whole suitcase and you need to, with whatever's in that bag, play each game for each game. In other words, from a sales perspective, the message was do each sale as if it's a game with points that have to be won. And incrementally, bit by bit, eating the elephant we will get to the World Cup. And that's what started shifting and that's what started changing. And that was kind of the motivational team message that went behind it. We also did, I'll share with you some of the more detailed stuff that we uh, designed in it together. But that messaging of showing up and pitching up also spoke about showing up as a whole person, as, as somebody that is not just somebody who's on a field for 90 minutes, but an ambassador for the sport and for the country for your whole existence and there were some famous stories of uh what they called omana or the old men of the team who had lots of experience and they would tweet certain things about moaning about being at practice and they were just not selected immediately they were dumped and they were done that was done in public in the open room in the forum and there's a lot of footage of what happened with that team in the in the um, conference rooms not what happened on the field and that's the important part of what we were bringing about is as much as you're out in the field as a salesperson, it's what you're doing back at home right now. That's very important. So that um, we, de we, de we developed a culture of wherever you are, you're carrying the brand. And we elevated and pushed the brand of doing things right for Africa as well. And try to lift and shift the game beyond just the survival mode that is what most people felt they were in. So those kinds of things worked very well to getting into the design. And let me share a little bit more with you about the specifics of the design. Um, but the main part was bring your tassi and show up with your tassi. And on the leaderboard, we had the X factor, which related to how you pitched up and showed up. The design and how we got people to line up really had to do with setting a target. And we set some very tough quarter three, quarter four numbers. And our financial year starts uh, in March. And we said, we've got to really build things from the first couple of months that we run this course. And we're going to see and look to see that by the time we finish the financial year in, we've accelerated order intake. So that's why it was called Sales Accelerated Bootcamp. And it was bootcamp because part of the culture in the company, unfortunately, is not one that likes to learn. It likes to fight fires, do what it does, uh, solve problems, do anything that needs urgent attention right now. And very little attention is paid on the future thinking or the future of the business and what we can do from a good platform basis to make sure that that future works. In fact, we're terrible at it. Uh, I think we're getting better at it now since this kind of thing and the leadership program we're working on with LRNG. But it's firefighting, urgent emergency, do what whoever shouts the loudest and which wheel is squeaking the most right now. So doing something like this was, was extraordinarily contraculture and very difficult to get right. 
So we had to do something important, like introduce a new concept <laughs> called customer. Um, believe it or not, um, people that paid us money were considered contract items, not customers. And along with another lady who came and did another transformation exercise on introducing NPS, the Net Promoter Score, and the concept of customer, which is somebody who you serve and not that you take an order from, these, along with the Sales Accelerator Bootcamp, were new concepts. And I kid you not, this is not really an exaggeration. So to become interesting and interested to somebody that you've previously been treated as somebody must fulfill an order and you need to get that done by a certain date and place and time was a big shift for many of our sales um, executives and team. So that whole customer concept and getting people right on what that looks like, Mike would bring um, different theory, different uh, current books and thinking into this picture and start showing and benchmarking and comparing what customers look like and how to treat them. And I know that as much as it's not really openly admitted, that was massively impactful in terms of one of the main takeaways for salespeople is, is that there's a new way to look at these people that are paying our salaries. Then we introduced another measurement beyond just commission, because commission, commission, commission is what's easy to focus on as a salesperson. Um, it was performance management. Performance management on what? The quality of your admin, the quality of your planning, the quality of your key account management. And you're going to hear me talk a little bit about the quarter inch hole and not the quarter inch drill in a, in a bit or two. That performance management and having a drumbeat and a cadence around what it is you need to do to just do the basics of key account management um, and do it in an integrated way around the new projects and, and products that we were starting to market. Um, steep learning curve. Other learning curves happened beyond the sales accelerator bootcamp on the, on the product and the and, uh, services side, but putting some measures to what that looks like and then actually asking a customer, how did I do? That was unheard of. So we did that. And, and Mike was very good at introducing and getting people to accept the invitation to go and query, how did I perform in my last sales call with you? And we got fascinating results. And those results and coaching on those results and dealing with those results brought massive shifts in thinking, discussion, debate, uh, and, and lots of obviously changes in behaviors. And you'll hear me refer to Pollyanna in a minute who brought about the single largest deal of the year. And this course was instrumental in her thinking about how to manage her accounts, treat an old client in a new way, and start delivering on more key account management uh, deliverables. So she was a, a strong recipient of that. Then there's the issue of process, 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 process. There's two languages a company speaks. Number one is money. And the other one is process. <clears throat> Up until this time, what the consistent process across all products was, wasn't understood and wasn't properly uh, managed uh, and definitely not managed. Everybody was kind of doing the best that they could with what they had to get the most commission. That was really as simple as it was. What wasn't understood is that good quality key account management would lead to, if not immediately at least, better commission. And the first step of better commission is increased order intake. And we did see some of those results. We'll talk, show you those in a sec. Then there was capability. And we started talking about the competencies of uh, a solutioneering salesperson, not an order taker and what it is that we would like to see. So we developed a competency framework with a good couple of standard benchmark issues that you would like to score. And we got the team to score themselves <clears throat> and we got them to score what they would like to be. And it was interesting how they themselves showed the gap. And that capability component is something I'll show you a little bit more in the outcomes of what it is that we're still focusing on today. And some of it still needs a lot of work, but at least the concepts are out there and we are starting to deal with it. And then the last one is systems and data. And one of the things that we still have as a problem from a process perspective is the fact that from sales through to business development, through to service delivery, through to the actual networks, planning and architecture, we hand off and over to different systems. We don't have a nice, neat, integrated ERP. 
Um, so we've got data issues and data problems, and we're dealing with customers that have left organizations 10 years ago, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is still a major issue, but we are still at least focusing on that now. So the boot camp made these issues competitive, and we ran that for a period of nine weeks, um, and we got some incredible results. Let me show you what we got there. If you look at the executive view on the skills gap, there's nothing green. Um, it was tough to deliver that message. We had to be very careful how we delivered that message. Um, you would imagine that amongst the sales cohort, that confidence is not in short supply. And when you get, when you get results like this, um, the way you manage and change manage and land that is difficult. You have to be cautious with that. And then with our skills capability perspective, uh, I haven't really made it big on purpose, but there are four, five major areas in red. And that is solutioning, building a business case. Our salespeople don't speak return on investment. They just look at what they call the contract number and the contract sale, and they know what their commission is out of that, and that's all they're focusing on. Whether or not we're actually able to deliver that and affordably and with a decent return on investment, is not something that salespeople used to think about very well. They do now. All right? And then there is um, the issue of presentation skills. Because they came from an order-taking environment, the sales community were suddenly finding themselves, and Pollyanna being one of them on the Sanron account, is, is that she was now speaking to an old client in a new way and found herself in a boardroom as opposed to the end of a phone and having to put together a bit of a solution that made sense and logic and that actually fitted with what the customer was looking for and after. And yes, it ended up in being invited into an RFP. And so we started shifting those things. So having a good hard look at the skills, doing something about giving them opportunities to practice them. We followed the 70-20-10 principle. So we didn't have much time with, with the teams. Um, and we broke the sales force into a couple of teams and they competed against each other. And that gamification was fantastic, especially for salespeople. But what they needed to do was learn some new behaviors. We didn't have the time to train it in the traditional sense. And certainly from an online perspective, that was difficult. So Mike would coach uh, the teams on various components of that. And then of course, it was feedback from what actually happened 70% of the time at work with feedback from colleagues and bosses. And that feedback cycle feeding into the coaching component really started bringing about who was fitting and our grid plan of the top performers and the people that we have to start really looking at investing in uh, or making other plans for. And this was incredible. And what we then moved to was the different results. And we've now got, there's now the top 100 We've done some key account management. We focused on what our enterprise clients are, what our ISP clients are, and what our what we call our formal network organization clients are. And with those different categorizations, proper key account management, <clears throat> we're finding people who fit better with those different types of sales. And we've got the team broken in a nice go-to-market strategy that has us as the systems integrator, the fixed network operator, and the channel wholesale ISP space. And we've got people that are better suited to those kinds of sales and that they're starting to build those kinds of relationships and able to tell that story far more successfully than trying to just bang every kind of product or service that they could in on a monthly basis. So there was some significant shift and it, and it started translating into what the key theme of this entire program was, and that's sell in the quarter inch hole not the quarter inch drill. And for years, this was uh, exactly what the company had been doing. We've got this fabulous network. It's very reliable. It's robust. Uh, it reaches all over. We've got Pan-African uh, capability and reach all sorts of redundancy built into it. Really, that's what was sold. <clears throat> Once they started talking to the customers in a new way about the different things that could go with it, ostensibly cloud, um, and we've also got relationships, part of the Cassava Technologies Group. We have got Africa data centers. We've got the power business. And we've got integrated whole value chain solutions that they're now able to sell from cradle to grave and not only sell you what we've got, but keep you alive and, and on power. 
So now the sale becomes a different conversation. And with that, people are starting to understand the enterprise sale. And there's three, two sales I want to tell you about here. And the first one I've been talking about a little bit already, and that is Sanron. And Pollyanna will tell you that this course specifically and pertinently got her to think differently about a customer she'd been dealing with for eight years already. And in doing so, they actually invited us to the RFP where previously they would not have considered that. They would have expected us to be a part of somebody selling the connectivity part to that RFP to somebody who was going to do the full-scale work. We won that deal, 500 million rand towards the end of that year. So there is no doubt that this course has at least influenced in some very positive way that particular sale. So that was a very big tick for, for the sales sector at Bootcamp. Um, but it's always difficult to say how that really, really translates because Pollyanna might also be motivated by her boss on the back. So to what extent was that the course? But it plays a role. The other part was Sun International. And with the way that the restructuring worked, along with this course and identifying skills and talent to do this kind of sell, we got the Sun International deal where we are the full systems integrator, which is the full suite of what is available from managed services through to the different cloud products, security, uh, and obviously on the backbone of connectivity that uh, becomes the least of their problems. And we manage all of that stuff around. And we pushed out a very big competitor. Uh, in fact, one that I see is next door to LRMG here. <laughs> so that's some really powerful quarter inch hole sales that have really, really worked. But I really want to share with you the last most important bit is if you look at the order intake numbers, and this is very, very powerful. This is numbers that was generated by Boyd Chislett, who is the chief business officer. And he's the one who remarked and says, I have to share this with everybody in the Exco, where the FY20 number you can see was the blue line doing what it did. And then you can see the COVID line of the purple line looking terrible. And you can see that we ran the course from January to April of that year. And at the beginning of March, the numbers were much of a muchness and looking the same. But before the course was even finished, the order intake was looking remarkable. And remember, this was still in a COVID, I think, stage five uh, situation, and things were starting to look good. And it actually just continued all the way up to the point where at our H1 half year, we had a 20% year-on-year increase. That has been sustained. In fact, it's gone up to 24%. The order intake is fantastic. In fact, it's generated another problem for us. We're now not in a position to deliver everything we sell, and we can't turn everything we sell into delivery or money. So we're moving further down the value chain, and we've created a new set of problems, but we are starting from the process perspective, building things up from the beginning. And here's the kicker. If you take the moderately priced course that LRMG put together for us, by the middle of May, that course, if you take a 10% return on actual revenue generated from the order intake, the course had finished paying for itself before six weeks beyond the course was finished. So if there isn't a return on investment that actually hit the spot, got the culture right with some great gamification, with an incredible story to tell. And that storytelling in the African context, I'm convinced, is crucial. And LRMG knows how to do that with us. Um, and that we connect it to purpose, which is we're doing this for far more than just uh, sorting out the revenue or the year-on-year -year order intake number. It's about connecting every African. And that's where LRMG and Liquid connected together. So there we are. That was the game plan. This is how LRMG have treated us. This is how we treated the sales team. This is how the sales team is treating their customers. Is see them, understand them, influence them, believe in what they do, engage properly, and then help them optimize. And with that, you're going to achieve not 20%. We're already on 25%, and we've got other problems, like you've heard me say. We can't now cope. We haven't got enough delivery capacity, and we have problems with equipment and chips and all sorts of other things that we're not in control of because the order and the sales issue has been solved. So I want to say thanks, <laughs> big thanks to LRMG and Mike for the most incredible course. 
We're already into the second round of that with the leadership development program, which is sorting out the integration issues across the company. Um, and we're looking for great things beyond this because once we get South Africa sorted, hopefully we can start journeying into the rest of Africa. So Mike, that's, uh, that's my story from my side. Thank you very much. Derek, super. Thank you so much for, for sharing, for sharing a story that, that continues to continues to engage and connect us to, to get to the next level. Because benchmark, benchmark, we never, we never, if the benchmark gets achieved, we just push it further. Um, got a couple of questions in the chat, and I've got a few that I'd like to 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 share with you. One of the questions sure. that was posed is. Did you get any unhealthy competition within within the gamification, and how did you how did you manage that? So it's sales guys, right? So the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, and unhealthy, uh, destructive, no. Um, but uh, yeah, so unhealthy competition. Uh, there was definitely elements of that. But what really dealt with it was the healthy competition was the fun, was the uh, gamification that kind of quite quickly quelled some of the negativity that popped up. Um, and I think what was best about that is, is that the team dealt with that themselves. Um, there were some fights about accounts um, and who needed to be getting what. And, uh, so the competition did get a bit heated and a bit intense, but I think once we also did the skills gap and skills analysis, that also resolved who went where and so on. And again, the team sorted out that themselves. At the heart of at the heart of the gamification was the invitation to shift to shift culture, the performance culture. But as you mentioned, we had to go digital in driving some key learning objects um, through through the various platforms. Have you do you think that went some way to shifting the learning culture? Um, and has this approach become a standard? Um, so it has the learning culture has been shifted in that people know that there is one and that it has benefit, but it's at a conceptual level. We have got a long way to go in this company of uh, really having and growing a genuine learning culture where a significant amount of anybody's day or time is given to improving talent, either them themselves or others around them. So. This mode of online training, we managed to navigate it very well with what we chose and how we did it. It has introduced the concept of learning to the company. And I think that in itself is a good thing, but it hasn't achieved what I would have hoped, which is actually put learning front and center on the culture scoreboard yet. So it's not on the balanced scorecard yet. Um, I hope for it to be there soon. So we are shifting quite a big cohort. Um, did you have to manage any exits that did not want to be part of the journey? Absolutely. Um, and I think that from a change perspective, as you discover uh, some bad news, some people themselves made their own exit um, quite quickly. And I think whether or not it was the performance culture that came along with it and that measurements of what quality looked like throughout the uh, value chain of making a sale, um, I think that that rang a, a bell for a couple of people. And then there were some stayers on who um, eventually just didn't make, but through performance management and through the new KPIs that did get managed. Um, and I think what the course did was set that up to be able to happen, which didn't really happen before. So it was something new for sure. So you talk about 20%, Derek. Um, from a delegate perspective, what do you think was their biggest impact? Coming out of the coming out of the journey, you mean the impact on a delegate for the delegates? I yes. Think, yeah, yeah. So, so for the delegates, I think what uh, you in particular brought is is that working together as a team and coaching will help them. Where there were possibly 150 individuals before, now there was a team of 150 people working in a different way. So I think the individual competition became minimized, despite the fact that we played a competitive gamified game. Um, and I think they stuck together more as a sales cohort. And they have understood and grown into the systems integrator, fixed network operator, and ISP business that we are now. So 
I think the identities of individuals has grown into those spaces because of this training and the coaching. We often look for what we call unintended benefits of, of a solution that we deliver. So an example of an unintended benefit would be, have we now created a profile for recruitment purposes that we can now hire against? What might be some of the unintended benefits that this solution brought? So I think that's, you know, now that you mentioned that profile, I think that there is a better understanding of the kind of solution salesperson or sales executive that we're looking for. Um, and it is much more executive. So um, uh, the, the lower level salesperson is, is moving more into the administrative role and the actual understanding of the industry or the space that the client is in uh, is something that has happened. The other unintended benefit is, is that we're breaking the system further down the chain. <laughs> um, and I know that right now, some people don't feel like that that's a benefit, but um, having too many orders that we can't cope with is actually a good benefit. So I'd rather have that problem than not enough orders coming in. And if we cast our eye to sustainability, um, in terms of coaching and being able to sustain and manage the disciplines, the habits that we spoke about, have the sales managers stepped up in terms of maintaining a coaching culture and process into, into the structures? Uh, so they have, um, but it, from a sustainability perspective, that's where I'd like to make more investment. Um, I know that that's been the, you know, from the leadership development program that the coaching component is the one that's having the most reach. Um, so I would like to see more of that, particularly on the sales key account management and some of the basics, you know, the process, the data stewardship and using the systems better. Um, those are the kind of performance measures I'd like to see coached and managed and checked and uh, done better than just have we made our number for the month. And we are still very much making the number for the month culture, but there are a couple of leaders who are saying, well, let's look at the bigger picture. What is the integrated whole doing and how are we impacting or affecting? further downstream so there has been an improvement um but again from a sustainability perspective as you know with the leadership development program integration across that entire value chain is something the organization really needs to focus on in order for things to become embedded um so yeah the the start has been made and we hope to keep kicking that can down the road so we two years we two years down since we implemented um have you seen any lasting, any really lasting changes that you feel you can attribute and good changes that you can feel to, you can attribute to the solution? Well, one of the things that happened is um, from a brand ambassador perspective, we actually got Beast Tenda and Tawarira, uh, who actually knows Strive Masiwa and, and uh, the guy who owns the business family well, and there's a resonance across Africa and the the, one of the big things is that that brand and image of a successful underdog coming up from the bottom and it's a story that's reaching beyond South Africa. Um, and uh, if there was anybody who was going to be able to do it, that'll be Beast. Um, so there are impacts beyond the South African borders of the South African story and this course and the, the Boca winning the World Cup beyond that. There's also obviously um, from an entrenched behavior perspective the integration is starting to work where before it was individual competition or doing the best that you can so that's the single largest thing there's a long way to go on getting the integration to really perform but i think we reached uh, the first of the obstacles in getting the team to work together and if we can do it with sales i'm quite sure that as we move down the value chain we're going to be able to knock those nails on the head so the start of the integrated systemic thinking is one of the takeaways that I think has landed in the sales community. What do you believe, Derek, is the next big thing for you in terms of maintaining the, the shift in culture, the shift in competitiveness, unlocking that competitive mindset? What's, what's, next, what's next for you at Liquid Intelligent Technologies? Yeah, so I think uh, where the leadership development program that we're just ending off now is ending indicates what that needs to be. And that is integrated performance management throughout the value chain. And you know, I do, I would like to see our balance scorecards got all the right things of EBITDA, cash flow, um, uh, NPS on there. What it doesn't have is learning or future-proofing the business. 
Um, and that's something that I would like to see, you know, from a strategic perspective, actually ends up on the balance scorecard. How that's going to get there is by continuing the integrated process improvement throughout the organization. We've got sales going. We've now got to look at the next step. We call that service delivery, which is taking the order and making it real. And there are significant challenges in getting the right flow and the right speed through that. And you heard we've now got the other problem where we're not really delivering as fast as we are saying we can from a sales perspective. So we've got to, it seems, deal with this value chain one piece at a time. And we will move, I think, down the value chain until we get everything right. Um, we're looking for some big investment. There might be some things on the cards that would start freeing up some cash to do more of the delivery and training and learning we want. But that from a process and from a learning and from a talent perspective is definitely the way we must, we must go. Derek, fantastic. Thank you so much for your time.